Hi, my name's Dr. Andrew Carr from the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. I'm here with Dr. John Blacksland, a colleague, who's written a new book, The Australian Army, From Whitlam to Howard. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Well, you've been a former Army officer. You're now a scholar. What led you to want to write about the Australian Army since the 1970s? Well, it struck me that there actually wasn't a compelling story out there explaining what the Australian Army has done since Vietnam. There's, tin, uh, there's potted stories of various aspects uh, along the way, but nobody had stepped back and tried to piece together uh, a narrative that actually wove the various components together and tried to explain it and provide some kind of uh, great bigger picture. Australians are used to hearing about their military in the field, and you list over 150 operations that the Army's been undertaking since that period. Mm. You also spent a bit of time looking at the back end of the army. Why was this important for the larger story you wanted to tell? Uh, it's important because people don't understand how the army has evolved. People, uh, people, those involved in the army uh, know about their little world, their, their experience in the last few years. Commentators outside uh, look at the army and it's quite opaque. And they don't quite understand some of the nuances of how it works, how it hangs together, why it functions the way it does. My sense was it was important to try and explain some of those uh, questions uh, and answer them in a way that was accessible to people who aren't necessarily specialists or practitioners. So I was trying to put a story together that was uh, going to be readable, uh, that would flow reasonably well and would tie together the various contributions on operations around the world over the, that 35 year period and making sense of it and explaining the, the rationale for the way the forces were put together, uh, the, the contributions they made and the significance of those contributions. Now when you say the Australian Army you are actually talking about just one branch of the Australian Defence Force. How well does this branch interact with the other services and how has that changed over the period you were studying? It's a very good question, Andrew. And the, the Australian Army um, has, for much of its history, operated independently, largely independently of the Australian Navy and the Australian Air Force. And that's because of coalition warfare. Uh, in, this, in the major conflicts that we've been involved in, uh, we've tended to operate uh, deploying Australian Army forces to work with British Army forces or US Army forces. And same with the Australian Navy and Air Force, they've operated with their counterparts. But in the last few decades, Australia has started to think more about its own defence, the defence of Australia. And in thinking about the defence of Australia, it's had to think about how the Army works with the Navy and the Air Force. And that's actually uh, made some cultural, presented some cultural challenges for the Army, as well as the Navy and the Air Force, as they've tried to reconcile with each other and understand how each other fits in with each other and complements each other. It's called jointery. It's something we haven't been very good at, but we get that the army has been essentially over the time of the covered in the book it, it, it slowly mastered the art of it and that was that came about as a consequence of a number of conflicts uh, and uh, deployments that the army as long as uh, uh, along with the navy and the air force participated in uh, and there was the lead up in the in the last years of the cold war uh, particularly starting with namibia and then in the post cold war year there's a years as a there's a a flurry of activity, uh, deployments to Rwanda, Cambodia, uh, Somalia, uh, and then of course closer to home we start getting more in Bougainville, Irian Jaya, Solomon Islands and East Timor. And the Timor experience is really uh, uh, a significant moment. It's kind of like the tipping point, if you like, in terms of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force recognising the need to be able to seriously work together. And that's what I try and capture in the book as well. And you certainly list a significant number of operations and in quite, some quite fascinating detail. It seems that whenever there's a conflict overseas or perhaps a natural disaster, even here in Australia, the first response from many politicians and Australian people is to call out the Australian Army. Do we perhaps expect too much of our armed forces? We certainly have very high expectations of our armed forces, but I think that's a reasonable thing. We spend quite a lot of money on it. Um, and we have extremely highly trained members of the Australian Defence Force, Army, Navy and Air Force. And there's a lot of work to be done. So uh, it is a high expectation. But it's interesting that the Army of today, the ADF of today, um, is pretty darn small 
There's only about 30,000 in the army, about 57,000 in the, the regular ADF at the moment. Uh, and when you compare this to neighbouring countries like uh, Indonesia, which has got a quarter of a million troops, uh, or even a, a comparable country like Canada, which has nearly 70,000 uh, regular troops, um, it's actually not that large. Uh, and we've got uh, the continent of Australia and the maritime zone to, to uh, assert uh, authority and control over. It's actually quite a large area of responsibility. And uh, when you have a, uh, a number of operations happening at one stage, as there is particularly uh, in the period covered in one chapter in 2006 and seven, it's actually pretty hard for the ADF to manage because you've got troops deployed in East Timor, in the Solomon Islands, off Fiji, in Papua New Guinea, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, you combine that with uh, the number of activities that were happening inside Australia, all of a sudden you, you find yourself juggling so many tasks, it becomes well nigh impossible to manage effectively. Um, but yet the Army and the ADF managed to pull it off in that period. Um, obviously there are, there are uh, rough edges along the way. It's very hard to make that work properly. But it is, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good news story about how, how the ADF and the Australian Army in particular managed to function effectively despite the spike in requirements at that time. And I guess that's the point about um, where things might go in the future as well. And I think the Australian public has, has recognised that in terms of the way our views seem to have shifted over the last few decades towards warm feelings towards our armed forces. In launching this book, General Morrison said that he believed the army had fallen out of touch with the Australian people. Do you think that's accurate and has that connection been restored? Yes and no. I think it is accurate, but then again, I, I think there are limitations to that view. Um, I think in the years after the Vietnam War, the army took quite a while to re-establish its uh, to reburnish its credentials in society. For a long time, soldiers weren't allowed to wear uniform outside of the barracks for fear of, uh, uh, of uh, repercussions. Um, but slowly, that, that changed. People put the past behind them over the, 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 the contentiousness of conscription in Vietnam in particular. Um, and as the Australian Army and the Defence Force more uh, broadly started to get involved in operations from 1989 onwards in particular, Namibia, then in Somalia, Rwanda, Cambodia and elsewhere, uh, the, 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 the partisan nature of some of the questions of where we deployed faded away. Uh, Foreign Minister at the time, Gareth Evans, was instrumental along with General John Sanderson in the contribution to Cambodia, for instance, in the early 1990s. This was a, a cathartic moment for, in terms of Australia's engagement in Southeast Asia and in terms of helping Southeast Asia emerge from the dark moments of the Cold War, particularly following the Vietnam War and the era of Pol Pot in Cambodia. So Australia, the, the Australian Army really was instrumental as a consequence of those directions from government um, in, in reshaping its own image, if you like. Uh, as a soldier, but more than that, as an ambassador, as a teacher, and as a peacekeeper, that 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 reimagination of the Australian soldier as somebody who spoke to the Australian condition, our egalitarian streak, our sense of justice, our sense of the right thing to do, that was very significant. But of course, it then reached a pinnacle uh, in 1999, uh, which. Uh, Ironically, was the point of the lowest, the nadir, if you like, the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. And yet in terms of Australia's view of its own army, uh, this is when uh, the, the, the things came home to roost, if you like, in terms of the investment in reform, in improvement, in professionalism that we talk about in the book. This is a book which in some ways you've been researching for decades perhaps through your own experience in the Army. You're now a scholar at the Strategic and Defence Study Centre at ANU. Was it difficult to get that distance, that perspective to write critically about something you had been so involved with over that time? Well, to be honest, that coming to ANU and working at the Strategic and Defence Study Centre has enabled me to finish this book. It, it's, it, I started it before then. But uh, being at this centre has been uh, terrific. It's been a very important part of being able to finish this, to be able to come up with a manuscript that is um, dispassionate, that is comprehensive, that is balanced. Uh, I like to think it is anyway. Uh, and that uh, is reasonably rigorous 
in examining what the army has done, the pluses, the minuses, the pitfalls, the strong, the, 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 the highlights. Um, and I'm indebted to my colleagues at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre for having uh, rigorously challenged me on a couple of my uh, uh, arguments and points and, and helped me clarify a couple of issues. So as a consequence of that robust engagement with my colleagues, it's a superior manuscript than it w was before. Well, I think you've certainly kind of proven the case in, uh, from my eyes at least, so well done. Thank you, Andrew. One final question. Australia has a new government uh, starting to try and work out what it might want to do with the Australian Army in the future. Do you, what lessons would you draw from this period that they may take and start to implement? Well, it's interesting as we reflect on um, the nature of this book. It, it covers the period from the end of the Vietnam War to the end of uh, the Howard ministry from the time Gough Whitlam was elected to John, when John Howard last office. 35 years. Um, th that period after the Vietnam War, uh, some people see there, there being parallels between perhaps the post-Afghanistan period for the Australian Army. So as we reflect on what happened in that period after Vietnam, admittedly there were different circumstances, the Cold War was still on for the first few years, but there are some key observations to make about pitfalls to be avoided this time around. There were some problems that the Army experienced, that the ADF experienced in the late 80s and into the early 90s that I think we can, uh, we can learn from, uh, particularly in light of the uncertainty we face. And as we look into the future, you know, none of us are very good at predicting the future, but there are pointers to circumstances in terms of climate change, in terms of political uncertainty, in terms of great power rivalry, in terms of dynamics uh, bilaterally with our neighboring countries uh, that are hard to predict. A, a year before we deployed into East Timor in 1999, no one predicted that we would have forces in East Timor. Uh, a, year be a, a week before the tsunami in Aceh, nobody had conceived that the Australian Defence Force would send troops to the contentious, closed-off uh, tip of the Sumatran Peninsula known as Aceh. It, was, it appeared inconceivable. So we actually aren't in a position to accurately forecast where the Australian Army and the De Australian Defence Force could be employed and how it could be employed in the future. So my sense is that we need to actually uh, hedge our bets. We need to have a versatile, uh, primed, capable force that is, has some legs, that has a, a, some endurance, uh, some ability to rapidly deploy and then sustain itself and then rotate troops. Uh, that's actually tricky to do. And we have a pretty darn small army as it is today, 30,000. Relatively speaking, that is one of the smallest in the region. Um, and it, so we need to be very careful as we look at uh, particular further refinements uh, in funding and in resourcing and in structuring the Australian Defence Force. We need to do this in a, in a soberly aware of the recent past which this book talks about. It's a very important story, so thank you very much for writing it. Thank you, Andrew. The book we've been discussing today is The Australian Army, From Whitlam to Howard by Dr John Blacksland. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew.